Hi, everybody. Welcome to Smarter News. I could not be more excited about the conversation that we're going to have today on a developing story that is truly unique in many, many ways. In in this one big way, I would say, though, we're speaking about the so-called mutiny that was taking place was taking place in Russia, is taking place in Ru This is the problem. We actually don't know exactly what is happening. And the pendulum is swinging so broadly in this story from this, again, so-called mutiny, impacting potentially the highest office in Russia, the leader of the country with the largest nuclear arsenal in the world, threatening his power, his position, the future of the country as we know it, or... Or it's swinging back to, nah, it was really not that much, not that big of a deal. It's over now and onwards from this point. This is what's transpired over the last, you know, three, four or five days. And so David Satter is with us. He's an American journalist. He's an author. He has reported on Russia for four decades plus. He speaks and reads Russian, which is really critical at this time. And in 2013, he became the first American expelled from Russia. He was working in Russia at the time since the Cold War, which is a distinction that I think we should always mention, and which actually I still have more questions for you, David, about. I know you've shared that story with us. This is the third time that David has spoken with us at Smarter News. He's one of your favorite interviews. He's one of my favorite interviews. We talked to him last year just as the war was starting in Ukraine. And I've been looking for just the right opportunity to have him back because he's very busy and so I reached out to David this weekend and said, would you please come back on and help us help us try to work through the story? David, it's great to see you. You're speaking to us from Paris. Um, I have so many questions. And I think maybe the first one is this, and then we'll kind of rewind and maybe go back through the last couple of days. But just broadly speaking, what's your take? What's your take on what's happening in Russia right now? You know, it's. Uh, I wish I could summar summarize the situation and tell you that I know precisely what's going on, but I don't. Uh, as for it being a so-called mutiny, I think it was a real mutiny, no question about that, because in fact, Russian uh, helicopter pilots and, and uh, aviators were killed. They opened fire on the Wagner column which uh, in, the, in 24 hours was able to uh, travel 800 kilometers, so that's 500 miles, and come to within striking distance of Moscow. So it's, uh, uh, if that's not a revolt, if that's not a mutiny, I'm not sure what is. The deeper question is, why did it end? What caused it to stop? Uh, we know that there are so many contradictory facts that it's hard to be certain. One thing we know is that there are reports, and they're pretty reliable, of units going over to the army units going over to the side of the Wagner group. They have 25,000 men, and their strike force was about 4,000. Uh, we know that they were greeted as heroes in Rostov on Don. Rostov on Don is the city that's the the nerve center for the operation against Ukraine. So that's very significant. We also know that during all that time that they were moving up what's called the M4 highway in, in Russia toward Moscow, no one stopped them. No one tried to stop them. So you have two alternative explanations. One is they sympathized with the, the Wagner uh, revolt, the Wagner forces, uh, the other is that they were ordered not to attack. But if they were ordered not to attack, then why were the, uh, why were the uh, aircraft and helicopters sent uh, using a uh, weapon, using a kind of bomb similar to napalm, uh, which they also uh, 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 dropped on, on civilians on the highway? Why, what's the reason for that? So uh, we can't, it, it seems more likely that uh, they did not get final orders or they declined to attack. 
but in the you know in the Russian military doctrine, if you uh, fail to uh, defend the country against an attack of some sort, and that's what this was, you yourself are guilty of a war crime of a well you're of a, of a breach of discipline. One of the reasons why I use that term so-called mutiny is is quite frankly I've I've struggled to to use words to describe what we're watching. And even from the leader of the Wagner or Wagner group, we, we hear that different terms, different different ways of pronouncing. In uh, Russian, it would be Wagner, but uh, Wagner. You know, when I'm, we translate it, it's Wagner. You know. I'm practicing my Russian, David. I don't know any Russian. If well, that's, if that's the extent of it, then I'll, <laughs> then I'll use it. Yes, I, I obviously do need to practice it for, for our news cycle. What are, so getting back to it, one of the reasons why I've struggled for, for the right words is that even the leader of the Wagner group came out today and said, oh, we weren't actually looking to overthrow the government. Here's the here's the rough translation of what he said. This is as of Tuesday morning, June 27th. He says, our decision to turn around was based on two important factors. The first factor is that we did not want to shed Russian blood, as you point out. Russian blood was shed. The second factor is that we were registering our protest and not seeking to overthrow the government of the country. That's what he says now. Do you believe that? That's what he says now. Uh, why was he marching out? What you know? Why was he sending four thousand men, with many more likely to follow, uh, to Moscow? Why was there a state of panic in Moscow? Why why were uh, people told to stay in their homes? Why were the air, you know the access routes to Moscow blocked? Uh, uh, you know he's not a fool. Uh, he knows that uh, uh, this is not a, trivi a trivial exercise, and that is not the way to remove uh, the top military leaders. I mean, once he got to Moscow, he 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 would would have been very unlikely to have stopped with the military leaders, particularly as he said that the war was based on a false narrative that Ukraine and NATO never threatened Russia. Well, that narrative came not from the military leaders. I mean, they were executing commands. That came from Putin and the government. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, with all of these people, all of these Russian leaders, you can't believe a word they say. And that, and that tr uh, uh, is true for, for Lukashenko. It doesn't mean that every word is a lie. I mean, they may accidentally be telling the truth, but... But when they describe events, they're describing what they want you to believe, not what necessarily happened. And that's what he wants you to believe at this point in time, because that for him at this point in time is, is advantageous, doesn't mean it's true. So let me yeah. just jump in here and let's just yeah. review the last couple of days, because, yeah. and I'll give it to you from, from just our perspective here in the United States, and then I'll be interested to hear your perspective with your background, David, because clearly it would sure. be very different. So uh, this is a smarter news perspective. Friday, Friday morning rolls around and we're hearing about something happening in a Southern city, a Southern city, as you point out, that is strategically important to the war in Ukraine, but not a Southern city that I've really talked about that much when it comes to covering Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. relatively big city. And there's video of this military, this private military company that we have talked about in the past, the Wagner group or the Wagner group that is coming into this city, being more or less welcomed in and greeted with, again, reports that they are going to challenge Putin's leadership or the leadership in Russia in some capacity. Now, because there's not a lot of independent journalists anywhere in this part of the world, when I'm seeing video like that, and I'm seeing stories like that, I have no way of verifying if that's video from two minutes ago or two years ago. It's very difficult. So on Friday, I looked at that news and I thought, okay, that's something that we're going to need to definitely watch. There's been murmurs that the Wagner Group is getting more and more uh, restless with what's happening in Ukraine, just to use kind of a, a light term, mm -hmm. uh, that there's been challenges to the Russian leadership in the military, that there's something unsettling happening for Russia. But we, again, very nonspecific as far as that. So that's Friday. I wake up on Saturday morning, and now this is really serious. We have Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, 
making a national address, talking about the betrayal that is taking place, that essentially the nation is under threat and those that are betraying the country will be punished. At the same time, we're hearing more now on the record from the Wagner Group, the leader of the Wagner Group, who's saying, hey, everything, speaking to the Russian audience, that you're being told about this war is wrong. We've lost territory, three to four number of soldiers that you've been told, three to four times the numbers of soldiers that you've been told have, have died, mm -hmm. are, have actually died. Um, this is, this is, we don't have the ammunition. We don't have the equipment. People are giving up. This is a lie. He's speaking. And so, and they're moving forces and it's our understanding they're moving forces towards Moscow. And just for some perspective, I was looking at a map trying to compare the driving distances. So this would be like a private military company rolling into Orlando, Florida and announcing to the United States that they're going to head to Washington, DC. So, you know, it's, you could drive it in a day if you wanted to. So this is all taking place on Saturday, but by the end, by the time we go to bed in, in the U S side on Saturday night, it seems that the tension that was suddenly ripe to explode has somehow gone away. And the leader in Belarus, who's known as a strong ally of Vladimir Putin, has somehow negotiated something to come to terms, very nonspecific terms uh, of, of, of some sort of settlements. Sunday, no one knows where anyone is. We don't know where Vladimir Putin is. The Secretary of State is on the record saying we don't know where Vladimir Putin is. We don't know where the head of the Wagner Group is. We actually don't know where anyone is. <laughs> <laughs> and Monday, we all wake up to more or less of the same thing. But the the mutiny is not continuing. The, the soldiers did stand down from the private company. And now it's Tuesday, and there's reports that the Wagner Group has moved to Belarus, that they're going to, they will have, quote unquote, safe passage there, that they're not going to face any sort of punishment so far. And Vladimir Putin has again made an address in public in Moscow congratulating everyone for the end of this conflict. So that's what we saw, David. What do you think of that summary? <laughs> and well, those the summary, terms? as far as the facts are concerned, is accurate. We have a period, a 24-hour period, that was just critical. That was the period after the, uh, the pilots opened fire on the Wagner column. And uh, they put out on their Telegram channel that this is the, 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 the a civil war has officially begun. And about 24 hours later, we learned that Prigozhin was had fled, that uh, you know that the column had stopped. Prigozhin had fled to Belarus, where presumably he is at the moment. What happened in those 24 hours? Uh, now certain things are coming out, the tapes of the supposed negotiations. Of course, there you can bet that those are not the complete tapes, and that the, they may have even been altered. We don't know. But there was there was one phrase uh, in there that I took note of, in which uh, uh, Lukashenko tells Prigozhin that he's talked to Putin, and Putin has told him that we've taken a very a hard decision. Then he used a kind of this Russian swear word. He said, he said, it will be this and that. I mean, you know, it's uh, some, some kind of just kind of criminal slang. And uh, so what was the decision that he took? Now, I, I, I think back to historical precedents sometimes. In 1921, after the Bolsheviks seized power in what became the Soviet Union, there was a massive peasant revolt in an area called the Tambov region. And it was spreading very rapidly. And the peasant army was quite well organized. It was led by a guy named Alexander Antonov. Uh, and they were getting, they when they captured communists, they tortured them in some cases, skinned them alive. They were absolutely, uh, they were the same kind of thugs that, uh, that, that fill the ranks of the, of the Wagner group. Uh, and uh, they, were, they were preparing to march on Moscow and put an end to the Bolshevik regime. And they, the Bolsheviks were seriously worried. 
and but they 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 decided that they would stop at nothing they started seizing hostages they started shooting the oldest son in any family that helped help the rebels but more important they attacked them for the first and this was the first time it was used in in a, a civil conflict they attacked them with poison gas uh, they flooded the forests where they had taken refuge with with poison gas and it worked uh they, they, they had no, the the uh, the peasant army had no defense against you know, a chemical attack. What was the decision that Putin was referring to? Would he have risked sending his troops to fight against the Wagner group, a group that has had been treated as heroes? for their stand in Bakhmut only a short time before, and under circumstances in which the whole army is totally demoralized. I mean, sending troops against them, it's one thing to, to send pilots who, 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 who attack from the air, but sending troops to fight against other Russians under those conditions in a war that they, for reasons they don't understand, to defend someone who, who has been shown to be a liar uh, in his explanations of the reasons for the Ukraine war uh, would, would have been very risky because it was very possible that those units, having been sent against the Wagner group, could turn their guns against the people who sent them and the, and, and the, and the, and the revolt could spread. So what was he talking about? What, did he, what was he referring to? We can only speculate. What would you uh, say? The, but there, but there were what was one remark that 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 uh, uh, that Prigozhin made. He said that he stopped in order to prevent a bloodbath. Right. Um, what kind of bloodbath was he talking about? Now, to, the first thing I can only now this is now we're getting into the realm of speculation. We don't have all the facts, but what occurred to me on the basis of my knowledge of the situation, was that they threatened to use uh, chemical weapons or weapons of mass destruction of some kind against which the, the, the Wagner columns would not have had any defense. And, and also, it's also possible that they, they, that they had taken hostages uh, who were still in Russia, relatives of some of the commanders or maybe Prigozhin himself, there's a report that he had relatives in St. Petersburg. That's a possibility. It's also a possibility that uh, people in Moscow on whom Prigozhin was counting uh, to, back, to back him in this revolt, uh, you know, got cold feet, uh, anything, you know, all of these. The one thing that I can say with confidence is we don't know the full story, but those are possibilities. And, um, but for whatever reason, uh, uh, Prigozhin stopped. And for the time being, uh, the danger to Putin's regime has passed. But it, do you revealed, think it's, do you so, think, do you think, do you think it really has passed, David? Do you well, think the danger I to, to is, wanted to say is that ahead. it revealed, it revealed fault lines. It's passed for you know. It's passed for these for the next twenty four hours. It's passed, you know. But 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 uh, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, that that Putin is out of danger. That the regime is out of danger. That this scenario won't be repeated in one form or another. That the front won't collapse now because uh, in Ukraine, after all, uh, the soldiers in Ukraine are well aware of what happened and uh and when and prigozhin also broke a real taboo for the russian leadership when he said that nato and and ukraine never threatened russia uh that's the whole justification for the war he also said something in early june in a video he said their mothers he's speaking of the soldiers that were killed their mothers, their wives, their children will come and eat them alive. He's speaking about the Russian military leadership when the time comes. And he was suggesting in this 
in this report from the New York Times that there was going to be a coming popular uh, revolt. So this was about 20 days ago when he said this, about two weeks yeah. ago. He <clears throat> said, I can tell you honestly, I think we have only about two to three months before the executions. That's what he was saying publicly. And he's supposed Part to be an ally. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, so, that, that, but he didn't say that the war was 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 based on a lie. I mean, the, the statement that it was based on a lie, that there was a, a false explanation for going to war. He said things like that before, that about the horrendous casualties. I mean, Wagner suffered 20,000 dead in Bakhmut. Uh, so, uh, and uh, in, that, in a situation like that, even with these criminals, emotions run high. So just let's let's take a step back. I showed the picture of Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin. He this is his wanted sign by the FBI. It's actually for something separate than his work at the Wagner Group. This is for allegations that he was in charge of this what's been called a troll farm uh, yeah. that was operating at the time of the 2016 election. And so election interference, a quarter of a million dollars, David, for information about his whereabouts. That's the reward that the FBI is giving out. The Wagner Group has been something that we became more familiar with in the recent years, that this is this private group, this paramilitary force. It's operating in tandem with the Russian government, but a little bit independently as well, and is operating in the shadows. The worst of the worst, as you mentioned, the, being recruited. These are prisoners being recruited out of, out of jail. Uh, these are the reputation of, of being uh, some of the darkest forces out there. And I'm just kind of generally speaking, using murder and rape and torture in all over the world, from Africa to the Middle East and also in Ukraine. So you've obviously covered Russia from the Soviet Union through the Cold War under the Putin administration. What can you tell us about uh, Prigozhin? What, what should we know about the leader of the Wagner Group? Well, this is a product of the Russian criminal underworld, but in a sense, so is Putin. Uh, Putin was a, an official and a former KGB agent who worked with gangsters. Uh, you know, uh, uh, he didn't. He wasn't a veteran of the Russian prisons, the way Prigozhin uh, is, and he has. That's a very brutal world. The not all of the leadership of the Wagner group or not all of the people in the Wagner group come from the prisons, but it was a natural, uh, a natural instinct of his to go back to the people he knew. Uh, and he knew how degraded they are and he knew how desperate they are and uh, make them a deal, which in some, some of them felt they couldn't refuse, even though the chances of survival were very slim. I mean, Russia is a very unusual country in that a huge percentage of the population has passed through the camps, has been in prison in what time or another. First of all, people are arrested for uh, rather trivial reasons. And uh, people in Russia commit a lot of crimes. There's a, a very, you know, the, the, the prison culture, the prison experience the world of the Russian prisons, that's very much a part of Russian culture, uh, the Russian underworld. One of the things that we didn't understand in the US or that, that was certainly not advertised was during the 1991 coup in August when various hardliners tried to save the Soviet Union uh, and Yeltsin opposed them. Uh, the Russian criminal world in addition to the young, idealistic young people who came out to support uh, uh, Yeltsin, uh, there were also uh, rather dark people because the, the Russian criminal world supported Yeltsin unanimously. You know, these people, you know, murder is not anything. They don't have any qualms about that. Uh, they, uh, they are sadistic because sadism is a part of the culture there. Uh, of that world. They don't place a high value on their own li on anyone's life or, and or even on their own lives. Uh, so they are in a way very good uh, candidates to be cannon fodder 
and Prigozhin having risen from that area, but being a little smarter and having established corrupt connections, was uh, uh, a very good candidate to be the leader of this army of zombies, of sadistic zombies, which is what basically what the what the Wagner group is. And they, uh, the reason why they achieved those successes, if you want to call them successes, in Bakhmut is because the, you know, they were ready to attack in human waves. Uh, they just kept coming. And, uh, but, but what, what I think alienated Prigozhin was the fact that, that, uh, that he wasn't getting the, the ammunition, the supplies, you know, he wanted, you know, he wanted results. And of course, beyond, at a certain point, he wanted to stop seeing people, you know, his people, killed in such numbers while uh, while others were not and so that's the you know that's it's uh, you know everything about this war is bar barbaric from beginning to end but the but the role of the uh, of the, the the Wagner group and the role of the criminal cannon fodder is is pretty horrifying we have a picture of Vladimir Putin and Prigozhin this is from years ago, and I don't know if you could see that, David. It's of Prigozhin I do, I do, I do see it. sort of serving Vladimir Putin. Prigozhin at one time was known as the the Kremlin's chef, right, David? That he had some sort of a reputation as running some sort of catering company with the government. Is well, that he, did. He, he, had, he had he had one of the best restaurants in uh, in Saint Petersburg. It's, you know, when I, in the 1990s, I knew someone who, who had a chain of restaurants, a woman who had been a, a criminal who came out of the camps. I don't know, maybe because they've gone hungry for so long that they, uh, they uh, learn how to cook and uh, value cooking and, and, and uh, but they, it just so happened. But, you know, from that, he branched out into other things. And as for the subservience, well, that too is typical of any kind of Kremlin uh, satrap. Uh, you know, they, everything depends on, the, at least at, an, at a certain stage, on the on the approval of the supreme leader, whoever that happens to be, and they they abase themselves. One of the reasons why I wanted to show this picture is it shows the the depth of the relationship between Prigozhin and Vladimir Putin, that this is not something new, that this has also gone back several decades. And now the latest news is that Prigozhin and the Wagner group, so it, with the information that's come more clear, again, over the last several hours, and yet we're waiting for a little bit more information, is that there was a move by the Russian government to absorb the Wagner group officially into the Russian military, that there would be no separation as we know it right now. That was, that that, was earlier. That was before the revolt. Right. And so now, yeah. apparently... The, part of this agreement is that that is going to take place, that the Wagner group is not going to operate, that them, they're going to. Some, some, some. So what do you think that means? Why, why would that be happening? And what do you make of that move by the Russian military or Vladimir Putin trying to absorb the Wagner group? Was that just because they were getting a little out of hand, that they were operating too independently, that they needed the, the backfill for forces, they needed the military expertise? What do you make of that? Well, they need the manpower. They're desperately short of manpower. They can't sacrifice all of that manpower, and uh, they and also they want them under the under now the defense ministry's control, uh, and that what you know they they got a good scare. Uh, whatever whatever happened, they, it was clear that 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 Putin was really frightened, and. Um, so they want, and but they can't sacrifice that many trained fighters, uh, some of whom are, are have proven themselves to be quite effective as fighters, more effective than the members of other units. Remember, Russia has has mobilized a lot of civilians, taken people out of civilian life and thrown them into this meat grinder, uh, and those people undoubtedly are not the world's best fighters, with minimal training sending them to the front lines. What do you think is the state of war in Ukraine? Well, we don't know exactly. I mean, there have been reports of some advances by the Ukrainians, but 
if the Russians end up being quite demoralized, that can only work to the benefit of the Ukrainians. Ukrainians have always had the advantage of, of high morale. And that's why even a, a small and outgunned, highly motivated army can sometimes defeat a much bigger and ostensibly more powerful foe. What's your sense of what's happening in Russia? Your reading of information coming out from, from that part of the world. How are the Russian people viewing this? Not only the events of the last several days, but now that we're a little further into the war, what is the public sentiment in Russia right now? Well, we can take uh, the, the events in Rostov as a, uh, an indication where the, the, uh, I think that a lot of people are beginning to get tired of the slaughter. And when the, uh, uh, when the Wagner group entered the city of almost a million with you know, minimal forces, had no trouble taking it over and were supported by the population, uh, that indicates that, that that war weariness is, is beginning to set in. And as more and more people, you know, the Russian people, and this is a very sad thing, are accustomed to the idea that they achieve their victories through, through massive sacrifice of personnel. And they tend to react much more calmly to the, to the death of, deaths of, of incredible numbers of soldiers than would be the case in the West. And that's why it's possible to send Russian troops into situations that are just suicidal. And, and count on them carrying out the orders. But, you know, the time comes when the futility becomes, in a, you know, so obvious and the, and the justification becomes so unconvincing that even in Russia, you know, you know I think the civilian front, many people, many of the civilians are, are frightened but what you know, but i'm sure that some part of the explanation for what happened with the wagner group was prigozhin's understanding that there was opposition in moscow i don't think he would have tried that without it and the other thing is that you mean opposition to putin he wouldn't have tried yeah, it without opposition knowing that it what's going that on it, in some places, whether it's in the public, but even higher places, there could be some supports that he wouldn't have tried even a little bit of this without sensing that that existed. Well, that's what I think. That's my mm -hmm. guess. I mean, I can't be sure about that, but there's the, the, we can't be sure about a lot of things. That's my guess. Uh, but because there is un, there has to be. I know from personal experience that there are people in the Russian military and in the security services who are normal people. Who, who have a degree of common sense and, and care about the country and realize that this is a total disaster, this war. And they also realize that Putin is, is, is who he is. He's this kind of criminal leader. Uh, and tell, t tell us more about that, David, about the people that you have met in the past. I know it's obviously you're not inside Russia right now, but tell us yeah. about those people and how they exist underneath the current regime and try to live well, they have their nowhere lives. Else to, they have nowhere else to go. They've made their careers in the army and the security services and they carry out our, uh, and, and uh, uh, they don't particularly dream of fleeing to the West, which is the only way to escape. And it's not clear that in all cases, the West would welcome them, but they, but they have their thoughts about what's going on. I mean, before the war began, there were warnings from military people that it would be a disaster. And those, you know, and if, if a handful of people were willing to say that publicly, you, we can guess that a very large number of people shared that view, but were afraid to speak. I can't help but reflect on our one of our first interviews, David, when you were talking about your investigative reporting related to the bombings that took place in Russia. No. In what year was that in the apartment building bombings? 1999. Well, that's how Putin came to power. Right. And your investigative reporting suggested that he was behind that. 
And yeah. not only your investigative reporting that there was evidence that he was responsible just so, to catch everybody up on these bombings that were taking place in the early morning hours, residential buildings in you know a bustling city that was terrorizing people, wondering, is my building actually going to be next? And your suggestion was what? That, that Putin was doing this because he wanted to coalesce his power at the time? Well, he needed, he was, he had, he was very unpopular. He, he this was a plot, really. Uh, Yeltsin's family was totally corrupt. And uh, I was told, you know, before this happened by someone who said that, the word is that to protect his corrupt family, Yeltsin is ready to blow up half of Moscow. And, and then the apartment buildings began, began to go up in the middle of the night. This was blamed on the Chechens. Uh, that was an excuse to start a new war against Chechnya, which the people really didn't want. And, uh, and under those circumstances, Putin suddenly, who was, who was a, a complete a uh, non-entity was not known. He'd not, never been a public politician. He emerged uh, because uh, Yeltsin had recently appointed him prime minister and was everywhere directing the war effort uh, and avenging this attack on innocent Russian citizens, and and uh, which in fact they carried out themselves. But that elevated his his popularity rating, and he was elected president. There was plenty it, of evidence about this. At the is time. there any any part of you that looks at the situation of this mutiny and yeah. wonders if Vladimir Putin had a hand in orchestrating it, if he knew it was coming, if it was a distraction of some sort that got the entire world focused on this? instead of focusing on something else? Is there any part of you that feels that something doesn't feel entirely right in the way that this is when being When you're reported? dealing with Russia, anything is possible. Anything is possible. I can't tell you that that's absolutely out of the question. But I think all the evidence suggests that's not what happened. He was too frightened, I mean, too taken by surprise. Uh, all of his reactions suggest a different interpretation and also to stage a mutiny in the middle of a war situation on which his future depends uh, a mutiny that could only demoralize the russian troops uh, that's a lot to imagine hard to see you know in in the case of 1999 they had to create a panic to justify a new war that could elevate putin's status in the country and that's what they did uh, in this situation, I don't see that uh, that there's an, an advantage for Putin. I think it's much more likely that that Prigozhin, and possibly backed by people in Moscow to some extent, in various military circles, that he uh, he had had enough, and uh, after losing twenty thousand men in Bakhmut. Uh, and quarreling co constantly with the Russian defense ministry and understanding that the war itself was, was basically uh, staged on behalf of the, of the rich uh, cronies of the leadership that he was denouncing. And he decided that uh, he, had, he had the forces to do what, for example, Antonov in 1921 considered doing, which was marching on Moscow. And he, he got pretty far. How likely is it that he survives? Uh, you know, you never know what the, you know, to what degree Putin will find him potentially useful. He's pardoned him for the deaths of the pilots. Ordinarily, that would have been a death sentence. You know, he would qualify for the death sentence for that. You know, mil military revolt, attack on Russian troops, and and the killing of pilots who were acting on orders of the government. Uh, that would have been more than enough to have him executed. The thing is, he still has a big following in the country, and Putin might feel that he that he can't risk eliminating him physically. Hmm.
One of the things I was thinking about, one of the stories I was reflecting on, so just to, again, put the pieces together a little bit, the head of the Wagner group is now apparently in, in Belarus. Belarus mm -hmm. is a, it was been described as a puppet government of Russia, Vladimir Putin. And I was reflecting on this story, David, you'll, you'll likely uh, remember it. It was about a year, two years ago. There, there was an uprising in, in Belarus in 2020. Yeah. There were oh, protests sure, yeah. that were happening. And there was a, a, a young man described as a journalist slash blogger uh, slash activist. And he was on a flight coming home from a vacation with his Russian girlfriend from, from Greece to Lithuania. And the plane, as it was flying in that direction, gets word from air traffic control in Belarus that there's a bomb on board and that they must land in the capital of Belarus. Right. They land in the capital of Belarus. And this was all a ruse to pull this young man and his girlfriend off the plane. Imagine this scenario. This is, again, a blogger, journalist, activist, pull him off a plane, early 20s, throw him in prison. He was just recently sentenced to, I believe it was eight years in prison for mm -hmm for his betrayal or trying to start unrest in the country and this totalitarian mm -hmm. government. So that's what they did to a 20 something blogger. And so the idea that the head of the Wagner group is just going to hang out in Belarus and everything's going to be copacetic seems sort of unbelievable. Well, they, it, won't, right? it, won't be, it won't be copacetic, but the, but, the thing is that young blogger didn't have thousands of troops that were devoted to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was, you know, you could do what you want with him. Uh, you know, if you, if you, you know, the question is, are you going to kill uh, Prigozhin? Uh, and that may, might not be advantageous for Putin right now. Is the world a safer place now? post this mutiny or less safe? How would you weigh it? It wasn't safe before and it's not safe now. Because you have people, these people in power who have don't don't respect any moral limits. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. What was it exactly that Putin was referring to in his conversation with Lukashenko when he said, you know that he's taken a very hard, serious, a hard, very hard decision, and then used these kind of, you know, obscene language to describe it. What, 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 what was the decision? Could that have had a role in convincing Prigozhin not to go any further? We know that that, I mean, I that he did not confront any Russian troops. On his on on his way to Moscow, and nor and he was not confronted by Russian troops. So that's what I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, and it's hard not to let the imagination run wild. We've heard all sorts of different scenarios, including recent ones from lawmakers talking yet again, lawmakers in the United States about the use of of nuclear weapons of different kinds in Ukraine. That's always been on the table. It seems to be coming up again. These nuclear weapons, we have certain visions of what they're like. Um, and the you know advanced technology has has led us to wonder, about more targeted attacks with with these nuclear weapons, and if that's mm -hmm. a, what what how far will Vladimir Putin go? Megan, one of our our followers here at Smarter News, has a I actually don't want to say followers a contributor because you could follow anybody, but most of the people that follow Smarter News are contributing to Smarter News on a regular basis in a variety mm -hmm. of ways, and we wouldn't be here without them. Megan is asking a really good question. She said, "Do you think that the people of Russia would ever overthrow Putin?" How complicated would that actually be? You you live there, David. How complicated mm. would that be? Is that a possibility? I don't think it's a possibility under existing circumstances. Uh, I think that if he's overthrown, it won't be by the you know by the, by the population, but rather by the you know groups in the military. Something like what we saw, you know, with Prigozhin. It might not take the form of a of an armed attack on Moscow. It might be uh, uh, simply uh, a faction that succeeded in getting enough support that they could go in and tell uh, Putin that 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 is he's finished. His time is or over. they could or they could arrest him. 
soldiers could turn on their commanders. That happened before the Bolshevik Revolution. But even in reporting the story over the last several days, David, I thought it was important to remind even myself as I'm looking at this story, mm -hmm. you know, if Prigozhin came into power in Russia, that's not necessarily a better alternative to Vladimir Putin. And so who could even rise to the power to take over a country like Russia? And would that would that be better for the world to have an alternative to to Vladimir Putin, or well, the is the is devil you know Pri better than the devil that you don't? Yeah, well, even Prigozhin, if he came to power, I mean, you know, we're talking. This is real speculation. On Absolutely our right. But even if if Prigozhin came to power, he he would not be committed to continuing the war. Our big interest is to uh, to end the war and to end it with a victory by Ukraine. Now, it, Putin can't easily a countenance that, but it wouldn't be a problem for Prigozhin, especially in terms of what he saw. Would he be more criminal than even than Putin? Uh, that's, that's speculation. I mean, certainly he wouldn't hesitate to use criminal methods. You know, you can't run the country that way. You can get rid of enemies. So, uh, I mean, I agree with the idea that we shouldn't try to back one side or another. We have had a lot of bad experience in the United States backing people in, in Russia uh, who we thought were progressive and liberal and on our side and turned out to be anything but, including Putin himself, by the way. Well, let but, me ask you this, David. Let's let's say if we're going to talk about speculation, let's just let's really go there. Then let's say. <laughs> I'm uh, afraid I I, I I feel guilty now. That no, I, no. Where this is going to, I'm actually going to bring you back to your you expertise. Into, I led you into no. this, but anyway. No, this is what this is where this is what everyone's talking about. So it's great to talk to someone that has some expertise, and there actually are very few people reminding everyone that a lot of what we're talking about is speculation because the reporting is so light, especially out of Russia, from sources that we can even rely upon. So we're sort of left here, and I think it's an important reminder that we're, we're in this mm -hmm. weird realm in a lot of ways. But let's say, let's say the Pentagon calls you, the State Department calls you, the president's also on the phone, and they say they just want advice based on your expertise living in Russia and seeing multiple people come to power. They say, David, what do you think we should consider after the last four or five days? If we really want to advance American interest in Russia in, in this part of the world, we, we want what's best for our country, which is we want us to be safe and we don't want to be involved in faraway wars that are taking resources away from our people. What should we consider based on your expertise? What do you think that we've been ignoring in our relationship with Russia and the Russian people? Well, you know, the the we've been ignoring practically everything uh, in the sense that we idealized the Russian leaders and ignored their crimes. And because we ignored their crimes, we weren't able to take steps to stop them. Now, I mean, the the, the war, the Russian-Ukraine war uh, was preventable. This was a preventable war. Uh, Boris Nemtsov, who was murdered in 2015, the Russian opposition leader, he and I, uh, when the Obama administration came in or was about to come in, they'd been elected, and I, we talked to the person who was going to be the chief Russia advisor, we tried to explain to him that that uh, Putin is not a partner of the United States. And he, you don't need to cooperate with him. You need to deter him. It fell on deaf ears. And the result was, of course, the reset policy, which took the view that all of the faults in U.S.-Russian relations were really because of the bad policies of George W. Bush. Now, that absolves Putin altogether. Putin had nothing to do with you know, the problem. It was an, a different American leader from a different party. But the, the failure to look at Russia with clear eyes, and of course they tried to do everything they can to confuse us, but 
our you know it's our job to understand Russia because it's a dangerous, powerful country, and we didn't uh, we didn't uh, fulfill that responsibility. So what can we do now? Now that we have a war on, now that the results of our mistakes are very obvious, the only thing that we can do is support that country which is trying to do with arms what we could have done peacefully had we had the you know the will to do it and that means we have to support ukraine we have to give them everything they need in order not just for their own sake but for the sake of those poor russian soldiers who are being thrown into this inferno uh because uh, the faster the war ends the more people are going to be left alive <laughs> What are you going to be watching for next over the next several days? We haven't even reached the one week anniversary of this event. Oh yeah, no. I mean, there's. I, I I I'm watching. I tell I tell you, Jenna. I'm watching this. You know, all the time. What oh, signs well, are you going to be watching to... for? What, what, are you looking for anything in particular? Who are you paying most? Well, attention I'm looking to? looking to see about the you know the fate of of I mean, of the Russian military leadership. Is there going to be a massive purge? Are is there are there going to be any signs of opposition? Uh, what about the security services? Uh, what 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 public statements are going to be made about the war in Ukraine? This could be an indirect indication because if they if they really feel that that they're on the edge of a disaster, a military disaster in Ukraine, they may make uh, some efforts to, uh, you know, to appeal for an end of, to the conflict, or at least on their terms, but at least, at least make an effort, more of an effort than they have heretofore. So, I mean, the, you know, all of these, all of these, you, you could call them straws in the wind. Uh, mm -hmm. You could call them, you know, indirect evidence. Uh, but all of this has to be watched to get a sense of, of what's happening. We, a lot of this is now outside our control. I mean, in a peaceful situation, uh, when, when uh, the object should have been to prevent a war and prevent uh, terror, uh, we had a lot of cards to play, which we didn't play. But at the present time, we have only one, which is back, you know, backing for Ukraine. We, what goes on inside the Kremlin, we can't influence, and it would be tricky if we tried because we could do the wrong thing, which we'd most likely do. Uh, so it's best not to interfere in that. Our, our, our leverage in this situation is helping Ukraine, which is something I'm afraid we, got, we really have to do. And as we know, there is some opposition to that in the U.S., Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of opposition and it, it bubbles up at different times. And as we get yeah, into an election, ways, period, yeah, different, different right. times. we're going to be and into if we, have, if we have a, uh, uh, we have a, um, an election coming, you know, uh, <laughs> which has a whole other, a whole other dynamic in the discussion, doesn't it, uh, David, with uh, questions nice. about, uh, is that timeline impacting how is that impacting not only the decisions of our leaders, but leaders mm -hmm. around the world waiting to see who's going to be in power? If, if we could just, if you could bottom line it for us, and you've been really generous with your time, David, so I just have two more questions. If you could just bottom line it to us about why, why does Russia matter? Why does Russia matter to Americans everywhere? Why do we need to pay attention to what's going on in this part of the world, whether there's the, the war in Ukraine or otherwise? Well, Russia matters for for a lot of reasons. First of all, because it's violated the the post war consensus, uh, the, uh, which preserved the peace uh, for all these many years, which is that we respect the boundaries of the borders of other country. By violating that, uh, the 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 commitment in the world to territorial integrity. Uh, Russia uh, took a step that is very destabilizing for the entire world order. So that in itself is important. The other thing is that Russia is a, you know, for all, all, all of its shortcomings is a country with a huge uh, capacity for uh, destruction, not only dis destruction of other people, but internal destruction, 
because they have you know incredible numbers of weapons and you pointed out they have the world's largest number of nuclear war, war warheads if things become unstable there if for example civil war were to break out you have a lot of of people who don't have don't recognize moral limits uh fighting to the death and uh, in proximity to weapons of mass destruction that could have implications for all of us uh so so russia definitely does matter and um, the fate of russia and there's a third reason which is that you know all of the destructive tendencies in modern society played out in russia uh all of the ideological temptations i mean it was russia that became communist it's russia that spread communism uh it's russia that created a totalitarian dictatorship uh it's Russia that announced that uh, there's no right and wrong. There's only the, the will of the party. Uh, these temptations, the, these ideas circulated everywhere. But they're like a virus. They attacked the, the, the political body that was the weakest. And that was Russia because of its you know, tradition of czarism and, and, and corruption. And so in a sense... There's, there's, there's a sense that's not just poetic, but I mean, the sense that they paid for our sins uh, because our false ideas, we weren't inoculated. Uh, we survived them. We contained them. But in Russia, they took over. And so therefore, in a certain sense, uh, if you think in terms of the responsibility of the whole world, uh, we want Russia to recover. We want Russia to become a democratic country, to strengthen democratic tendencies everywhere. That gives us a lot to think about. I was thinking about your story as well. Leaving Russia in 2013 on a routine task to renew your visa. You had yeah. your apartment, your life. You had lived in Russia at that point for many years. And you've talked about in the past how going back to your beginning beginnings as a reporter in Chicago, like, and even before that being fascinated with Russian culture, this is how you learn the language. And here you find yourself in this historic time in Russia and you've lived your life there and you've, you've gone through periods of this country uh, evolving in so many ways. And so in 2013, you leave just to renew your visa and you find out that you're not allowed to go back in. And I want everyone to think about that, what that's like if you left your home today not knowing that you would never be able to go back to it. And my heart sort of breaks for you, David, about that, in that you haven't been able to go back. And I just wonder, no. what do you miss? What do you, because there was, with all the, there's obviously a lot of criticism on, on Ru the Russia regime, um, but there's also an amazing culture and obviously one that you very much have appreciated for a long time. And I'm just wondering, you know, what do you miss most about living in Russia? What do you, what is that feeling like to to not be able to to go back? Well, I should add that. Uh, well, f yeah, I'm, I do miss Russia, and I miss miss my friends there. I miss I miss the life there in many ways. Uh, I I miss the intellectual life, among other things, which is actually quite intense. Uh, but I haven't been completely cut off from Russia because. Many Russians are now abroad, and I, I'm broadcast in Russian to the Russian people all the time on Radio Liberty. So I feel I'm. it's not as if I'm totally disconnected from what goes on there. People, you know, I get a lot of communication from there, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm known there. So... Uh, it's not as complete a break as it as one might think. Uh, physically, of course, I haven't been able to go back, but I never stopped dealing with Russian matters. I mean, I'm writing writing a book now, a history of Russia after the fall of communism. So, so I mean, I think the the uh, I had a conversation with Ahmed Zakayev, who's the president in exile of Chechnya and who he's a democratic leader and he would and you know, when the Rigozhin, uh, uh prigozhin i'm sorry uh 
uh, revolt broke out. He said that, well, you know, we'll be back in Grozny, which is the capital of Chechnya, uh, by the, you know, in the next couple of months, and we're, we'll invite you and name a square after you, because I was the first person who said the Chechens were innocent and that they didn't bomb those buildings. It was done by the by the secret police, the Russian secret police. But the the the, the point is that um, there are a lot of people in all over Russia and uh, who would be very glad to see me uh, if there's a change in the in the power situation. Uh, and I would be glad to see them. Mm -hmm. So who knows what you, we, we, we don't know. We never know what the future holds. And uh, Russia is a country of, of dramatic changes. I think it was Bismarck who said that there are two things we can never know, what the weather will be tomorrow and what's going to happen in Russia. So <laughs> we have to keep that in mind. Well, if we got a reminder of anything over the last several days is that the world actually can change really fast and that Very the fast. things that you think are always going to be there, it's never, you know, that feeling things will never change. It'll never change from this moment. And we don't, nothing is further from the truth. Things can change really fast. They and can. we have to remain open and curious about all of that. So, uh, I'll look forward to that square, David, by the way. That sounds well, great. I'll invite, square. I'll invite I like you that. to the dedication. <laughs> <laughs> we want a live yeah. interview, maybe exclusive. We'll negotiate that. I know you're popular. So <laughs> <All right. laughs> someday, someday we'll do a, a smarter happen. Russia excursion for our, <laughs> yeah. for our audience. <laughs> David, it's so great to have you. Thank you so much for the time today. I really very much appreciate it. I'm always glad to, to see you, Jenna. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing smarter.